understanding that owning a real asset that has finite supply will probably be the best performing assets of the next 10 to 15 years. And I, I think that uh, this phenomenon happening with China, uh, which we call the, the, the Chinese uh, gold rush, um, is to me, it's just the beginning. It's not the end of it. And we're probably going to see a lot of other central banks follow suit and try to uh, accumulate uh, hard assets despite in, in commodities will become more and more imperative for societies and also more and more geopolitically strategic for nations to hoard those uh, those assets over time. The truth is, if gold is in a bull market, all the metals are in a bull market. In fact, all agricultural commodities will be in a, in a bull market. Historically, commodities tend to follow each other. Today with me is Tavi Costa. He's not only a partner and portfolio manager at Crescat Capital, but he also shares his great charts and analysis on Twitter and LinkedIn, for example. And he really provides a deep insight into the world of commodities and obviously macroeconomic situations. Tavi, first of all, it's great uh, great having you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Great. So, Tavi, let's start with the most obvious thing today. I think uh, many investors are really currently looking at the Fed and the European Central Bank. Every, everybody's concerned about the rate cuts, right? If we remember back by the beginning of this year, the whole market was screaming for rate cuts. We will have 10 rate cuts this year. Uh, everything will be different. But uh, obviously, inflation and rates are here for a little bit longer. As, at least in the US, right? When it comes to the European Central Bank, we lowered the rates today here in, in Europe. What are your thoughts on this decision of the European Central Bank? Do you know, the, uh, do you think the Fed will follow soon? And are they even know, do they even know what they are doing? Uh, we can try to answer these questions with sort of a short term way and, and, and try to explain on a day to day basis. But really, I think this falls into a long term trend that we're seeing, which is called the trifecta of macro imbalances. The fact that we have not only a, a very large debt problem across most developed economies, and then inflation is the second thing that is, is um, an imbalance that we haven't faced in many decades, uh, probably since the 1970s. And the third one is the valuation of financial assets at our extreme levels, which forces uh, central banks to always restore Uh, their financial repression policies, which is cutting interest rates or monetary dilution and all sorts of things. Um, the big question as we move forward is how are we going to deal with the debt problem? And it's sort of interesting how today's investors continue to uh, have a very lower allocation to hard assets relative to financial assets, historically speaking, at a time when very clearly, in my in my view at least, um, those central banks and large monetary institutions are going to be facing a problem of uh, not only inflation, having to allow inflation to stay longer, uh, higher for longer, but also uh, potentially having to either monetize the debt or uh, or actually proceed with some sort of debt jubilee um, uh, you know, uh, procedure as well. And so those are, are very significant changes that tend to cause Uh, hard assets to rise, not only that, but also the businesses that produce those those assets to do very well. And so it's no surprise that commodities are doing very well. And this is all coming along at a time when uh, we know that the capital spending for these industries have been for a long time now uh, highly uh, depressed. And so uh, we know that the supply uh, has a lag on this. So capital spending takes a long time until it, it actually um, results in higher supply of a certain commodity. And so as we see these um, the difficulty of finding capital entering these industries, it, it, it's only going to exacerbate the needs for uh, for commodities and also uh, exacerbate the trends in terms of prices um, and the cycle itself to be uh, elongated and likely to be one of the, the longest uh, cycles for, for real assets that we've seen in history. 
Mm -hmm. Great, great. Before we go deeper into the commodities and especially the junior mining space, uh, which would be really interesting, let's stick to the uh, financial situation and overall for a second. Especially you, you talked about uh, the, the problems that come with the debt situation, right? Um, what else do you think our financial system is facing right now? I mean, obviously... We, we are still in the same situation that we had like in, let's say, 2008, but we printed enough money to, to go forward, right? The financial system is somehow still alive. Many people couldn't believe it. But um, today we are facing new challenges, more challenges than ever. Um, do you think we are kind of at, a, let's say, the, the point of no return already? Or is there still a way to, to secure or to, to stick with the financial system at how it is? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think this not to have a doom and gloom uh, view about this environment. I, I personally think this is very different than what we faced back in 2008. I think that most of the debt issues and the imbalances we had in 08 were basically transferred out of the consumer and out of the private companies uh, and private businesses into the government. And so we have state and local uh, and federal Uh, government, it is completely broke in the U.S. and other in other developed economies, and they're the ones that have provided liquidity to consumers and businesses during COVID or even after COVID recession and other uh, other uh, uh, crashes that we had in the economy throughout this period since the global financial crisis, in which allowed this transition of the imbalance out of the consumer uh, pockets and also out of the private businesses into the government. And so the big question here is how do we move forward with sovereign debt uh, instruments that have grown to become one of the largest asset classes in the world? And now we're seeing a flood of those issu issuances and not enough buyers of those securities at a time when most of the popular or tra traditional capital allocators of pension funds and uh, retirement uh, accounts and other things are all still living in, an, uh, in, a, in a world of, of where 60, 40 portfolios work, uh, when what we're seeing in terms of the data and the performance itself is quite the contrary uh, of, of that. And so it is a, a scary how this the these changes are Uh, happening all at once, and a lot of people are dismissing these uh, these clear trends, in my view. And so, how do I think things will evolve? Um, it's going to force the economy to look for ways to fix the debt problem. And there's a lot of things that we're going to have to think about. Um, you know, one theme that is often spoken um, by most macro folks is fiscal dominance. Um, can we keep fiscal dominance with such a large indebted economy already? Is that even possible? You know, if we go back to periods like the 1940s, when we had a debt problem like we have today, uh, it forced the government to go back to a primary budget uh, surplus, in, in which today would be unthinkable. And so we have this AI revolution that requires a massive amount of infrastructure not only from electrical grids, but also data centers and all sorts of things in order to enable these policies, or I should say these technological advancements to be more deflationary and create productivity growth. But we need to build things in order to have that. And so this is why I believe that the next 10 to 15 years are going to be highly inflationary. And that doesn't mean inflation will be, you know, running at a certain level for a certain amount of years, inflation is cyclical, but it will be, in my opinion, uh, an average for the next 10 to 15 years, much higher than what we've seen throughout the history. And so we have to put our hats as a, an investor uh, with that framework of higher inflation or inflation higher inflation for longer and thinking about what are the usual segments of the market that tend to perform very well. And the fact that we've been for over 30 years in a disinflationary environment, it's quite telling because of how the capital itself in terms of allocation has swung completely into financial assets, uh, particularly technology and, and fixed income and other things, and forgotten about real assets. And I think that migration of capital out of those 
asset classes into things that have been neglected for a long time uh, is what will create most of the big opportunities. So the big short today is not the banks, is probably not necessarily the housing market or other things. In my opinion, the big short today is fiat currencies and understanding that owning a real asset that has finite supply will probably be the best performing assets of the next 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. That's interesting and sounds reasonable. But uh, Tavi, why is it? Uh, why does it seem like that the Chinese seems to understand the situation, right? The People's Bank of China is buying gold like crazy. But in the Western part, uh, as you already said, most of the asset managers and big investment firms, they stick to the 60-40 portfolio. W what is it? What, what do they have to understand? What are these guys waiting for? And what are that, uh, your expectations on gold as soon as they switch? Well, we need to understand first that China is in a situation that is a lot more desperate than other economies, number one. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the amount of credit and how much money has been printed in, in Chinese yuan over the years, is actually larger. Uh, in fact, their M2 um, money supply is double the size in the U.S. with an economy that is about 40% smaller. So clearly there has been you know, a large increase of credit happening in China, uh, which we were, you know, very Chinese bears back five, four years ago, um, wrote many letters about the real estate issues. We were short Evergrande, Sunak, most of the banks uh, in China. And today we are flat on that position. We have not um, been uh, exposed to the Chinese market at all. And the main reason for that is because we believe that China is entering kind of a, a Japanification period where um, the big lesson from Japan where there has been more units of debt to generate less units of growth uh, really translate into weaker currency over time. So China is in a desperate mood to improve the quality of their international reserves in order to sort of reestablish um, some credibility in their currency and allow this devaluation of their currency to occur in a in a um, in a slow paced manner rather than a rapid one, um, and and similar to what we've seen with with uh, the the BOJ or the the Japanese yen, I should say, uh, in which that was a, the the real impact of those that stagnation period or the the lost decades that people tend to call it in Japan was really the depreciation of the Japanese yen over the years. And so I think China is not like a lot of folks believe that they're playing chess and other economies are playing checkers, but really they are being forced to uh, buy gold and and, and, uh, and and transition away from treasuries and other sovereign debt instruments in order to, again, improve the quality of their international reserves. Now, this is a global phenomenon. It's not just China. Russia is doing the same. We were seeing other trends in Saudi Arabia, uh, but globally, People are still buying treasuries, believe it or not. I mean, I'm the biggest bear of treasuries. And I, when I look at the central banks and how much they own of treasuries, their holdings is actually at record levels. And the main reason for that is because the ECB and the BOJ continue to buy uh, U.S. treasuries and, uh, and causing this, this, uh, the holdings to rise. What's not happening is that the holdings of those central banks is declining in relative terms to how much has been issued. So if you look at their holdings relative to the issuances that we've seen and how much is outstanding of the debt, that number itself has been shrinking. And so uh, those are all important changes that are happening uh, right in front of us. Um, and I, I think that uh, this phenomenon happening with China, uh, which we call the, the, the Chinese uh, gold rush, um, is... To me, it's just the beginning. It's not the end of it. And we're probably going to see a lot of other central banks follow suit and try to uh, accumulate uh, hard assets. Despite, and, and commodities will become more and more imperative for societies and also more and more geopolitically strategic for nations to hoard those, uh, those assets over time as we see the need for the use of those things, but also um, the, a more deglobalized environment, which requires uh, countries to have a safer uh, logistics system. And so on, onshoring and, and rebuilding their economies is something we're in the process of seeing. So, uh, so yeah, th those are my thoughts on, on your question. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's good to hear. So, um, if we, I mean, you're a portfolio manager, uh, especially in the in the resource and uh, precious metal space, right? Uh, what what kind of resources are you looking at at the moment? Is it probably silver? Because I think uh, for me, silver could be the next uranium. If you if you want to like that, it's been boring for quite a while, but we now see it picking it up. We went through the thirty dollar line, which is also good. Uh, silver and Japanese yen already showed how it how it's going, right? So, uh, what what kind of commodities are you looking at? Well, boring is good. When when a commodity has been has been in a boring trend, it means that it's about to leave that trend. It's been consolidating and it's about to explode. And what is fascinating about commodities is that they tend to work in a rotation dynamic where while everybody's focus, let's say, in lumber prices rising in 2021, it then flips into natural gas, that then natural gas rises and then starts to fall, and then it flips into oil, and then it flips into agricultural commodities, and then it flips into gold, and they keep rotating, but all the direction of the equal weighted price of commodities keeps going higher. So we need to think about this very well, because recently we've had gold prices breaking out, copper followed along, and then silver, now it's moving the right direction. So what is next? Um, I think silver is in the process of reestablishing itself at much higher prices uh, that historically we have seen only at peak levels. This might be a place where silver may actually uh, see sustainable prices uh, at higher double digit levels. Um, you know, and I'm talking 40, 50, 60 dollars uh, an ounce. Uh, sort of uh, uh, prices. I think that, that that's ultimately where we're heading towards uh, and potentially even triple digits. But silver is going to be volatile. And so we. this is a very a great uh, environment because a lot of the mines that are being sold today, even by, by the miners themselves, when they provide the data for you to bid on their, on their assets um, separately, what you find is that they are actually using gold and silver prices that are drastically lower than market prices. Now, I'll give an example. We're looking at a mine today in which is basically being sold by about one time free cash flow. Um, and when you look at the, the, the free cash flow model that they are providing to us, the prices that they're using is $18.50, I'm sorry, $1,850 uh, $1 um, for gold prices, where we're basically trading at $2,400 already. And so, you know, it is it is shocking to see those things because uh, clearly there's still fire sales across most of those mining projects uh, with metal prices sustainably being higher. So when you ask me what is the next metal to move, um, I am paying attention to a lot of uh, metals. Uh, we have very large exposure to zinc, um, lead, um, silver is my favorite metal, um, gold is... You know, while gold prices are increasing, what what really is attractive to me on gold is the miners, because a lot of people like gold, but they don't like the gold miners. And I think that that's, you know, that is not even a boring thing. It's just people are just completely skeptics about the this, this part of the industry. And uh, what is the catalyst for those things to work is usually gold prices entering a bull market. And I think we're seeing that right now. And so... I'm paying attention to all metals because all these metals, they act together. You know, we all try to be cute and look at and say, well, you know, copper has a little more cyclicality and then gold and, and, and silver tends to lead and all that. But the truth is, if gold is in a bull market, all the metals are in a bull market. In fact, all agricultural commodities will be in a, in a bull market. Historically, commodities tend to follow each other. And so outside of energy, energy can be, you know, it's its own its own world. But um, most of other commodities tend to move in tandem. And I do think energy will move in tandem this time as well. And some folks would also say caution with the miners, because if oil prices go to three hundred dollars a barrel or two hundred dollars, you're going to lose money in, in, in your miners. And it's not true. I mean, if you if you think about it in the early 2000s. The miners did very well, despite the fact that the gold to oil ratio was falling. In other words, oil was rising faster than gold. And despite all that, the miners did fine. And so, you know, we have to really look at history uh, with more in-depth 
uh, manner in, in, in order to see um, the opportunities. And so I, I do think that the, the mining industry, while you asked me that my favorite metal, the mining industry still is the best asymmetric way to express his view in the markets right now. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for your statement on that. Uh, you already uh, mentioned that we should have a look at the history. Let's have a look at the 1970s. I mean, uh, that sounds pretty familiar to me. Uh, we've had seen a first inflationary wave already. We could be up for a second inflationary wave, uh, especially in the 70s. It took a while for the people to really understand what inflation means to their, to their money. But then all of a sudden, right, the gold price went up. The miners then had uh, extraordinary time. Times. Do you see similarities here? Uh, could we be in the same situation? Well, I think the difference from the 1970s is clearly the debt problem. And if we saw gold rise as much as it did in the 1970s with interest rates rising as much as they did, imagine what it could do today when we actually have an environment where rates could be subdued just because of, of the fact that we cannot take cost of debt being sustainably higher just because of the level of debt that we currently have. And so the U.S. is running already interest payments close to 5% relative to GDP. So we got to grow GDP at 5% just to pay down interest payments. And that is a dangerous level, uh, even according to IMF and, and BIS um, uh, research. And so I, I do think that this is quite concerning where we are currently with the U.S. in terms of that. And, and that's really what is likely to drive um, the Fed and other central banks to cut interest rates. And as we see that, those rates cut, those rate cuts and, and, and having to uh, bend on their policy that is supposed to be fighting inflation, but rather has to be alleviated by uh, because of the financial stress of higher cost of capital in 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 a highly levered economy um, is is ultimately what drives the the value of hard assets much higher. So to me, that's a big difference between 1970s and today is the lever leverage uh, ratio that we have in the U.S. and other developed economies. The second thing is back in those days, we were in a time when. Uh, we just uh, uh, basically entered a phase of a less disciplinary world. That was the time when we broke the gold standard. And today we've been in that world for a long time already. You know, many decades have come through, have created many imbalances, and particularly the debt problem uh, because of the, the, the lack of discipline on the monetary and fiscal side. And that is what's ultimately... Um, you know, we can actually see a more discipl disciplinary world coming back uh, as a consequence of all these issues that are starting to unfold in the markets. And so, you know, in my view, it is highly likely that uh, elections can actually in the U.S. be a trigger for a lot of issues, meaning, um, you know, if we start seeing things like trying to cut taxes or 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 increase spending for, for some reason uh, in terms of the, the infrastructure developments and other things, uh, that can be perceived by the market in a very uh, a wrong way. And I think that, that that's a high uh, a highly possible. And if we see that, we can see another Bank of England moment in the US when we had interest rates in England um, or, or in the UK guilt uh, sovereign debt instrument uh, spiking after they try to cut Uh, their taxes and 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 other policies, um, and and the market didn't like that. So I, I do think there is a, a chance for something along those lines to happen, uh, which is sort of like a shock to the market uh, caused by a total lack of discipline by either monetary or fiscal authorities, uh, in which it causes the market to say enough is enough, um, and we're not too far from those those issues, and so. Uh, but I think ultimately is the whole reason why as central banks are forced to create um, a place where they have to put interest rates much lower and then allow inflation to run much hotter is what creates this um, you know, upper pressure on other assets that have been for a long time ignored. And that's hard assets, in my opinion. And looking back in history, 1910s, 1940s and 1970s, which were the three inflationary decades, Those are all periods where hard assets outperform financial assets in a substantial way. Mm. 
Great. All right. That's good to know. And uh, it seems like we are in a right spot, right, with uh, being into metals, into the precious metal industry and into the mining industry. Uh, that really sounds good. So, uh, Tavi, as you know, we are from Germany and we do have a lot of German retail followers. Maybe for the end, you gra gave us some great insights. Uh, what are your um, your uh, your advices for, for German retailers that are really struggling with inflation here? We can really see it in Germany. I'm always telling the people like, 20 years ago uh, you could go with like 100 euro it was impossible to spend 100 euro by grocery shopping right today you need at least 100 euro to get a little bit into your grocery shopping so what is your advice to all these people is it to buy gold to buy hard asset is there any any other asset you could uh, you could refer on or is it is it especially gold and uh, hard assets no i think it's actually the miners i mean gold mm -hmm. is already responding to most of those those issues uh, i think the miners are yet to respond and it's very clear to me especially private companies that we own that fundamentals of these companies are improving drastically because cost is not keeping up with the price of the metal and the metal is definitely creating great margins for most of these companies and that's that's just a, an incredible setup for these businesses And so we are accumulating companies in the space because nobody wants them. And so yeah. it's a great, I think it's a great, and it's hard to believe we're going to see all these spending uh, that we're going to see in terms of infrastructure without making the mining industry at least significantly more relevant than what it is currently. So all these things are going to be important shifts. And uh, people, you know, my suggestion is that people tend to wait for confirmation before acting. And a lot of times the best investors Uh, tend to act with conviction on things uh, that have not moved yet, but are likely to move. And uh, to me, that's that's a classic example using the mining industry today. All right. So is your advice to, to buy basically now or to wait a little bit longer to have a signal of the market? I mean, the junior market, there's still blood on the street, right? That's usually the, the time to buy. Uh, uh, wait or buy now? I don't think you can be that smart to figure out the perfect timing. Yeah. You know, I, I, when we were, we bought the seventh largest silver mine in the world. Nobody would sell that mine with the silver at thirty dollars. Nobody. Yeah. So what do you do? You 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 make up those those uh, those perfect negotiations tend to happen at times when everybody is stressed, and so that's what we did. Now, there are other opportunities now that are still that way, despite the fact that gold and silver prices are much higher. And we got to take advantage of those things and not wait for prices to move higher. That's just, yeah. the, the you know, completely backward looking. So to me is, is I don't care if I'm wrong for one or two or three years. Yeah. But if I'm buying things cheap that can be multiples of my capital uh, in this decade, That's what I'm looking forward to. So I'm, you know, I'm very focused in those types of investments. Sounds good. To me, it is really the place to be for this decade. Uh, thank you very much, Tavi, for all your insight. It was really a pre pleasure talking to you. Is there any last word for the end from you? No, just think about the mindset of inflation staying higher for longer and how to protect against that. Because the big short is the devaluation of fiat currencies. That would be my final thought. Great. Everyone, follow Tavi Costa on LinkedIn, on Twitter. We will link all of your uh, accounts below. Tavi, thank you very much for your time, for your insight. It was great. Thanks for having me. Thank you.